Excellent. Well, uh, happy Thursday to everybody. My name is Phil Gwoki, and I want to thank you so much for joining us today for this month's community conversation. Uh, as a part of the registration process, we invited you to share what you hope to learn from this discussion. And we received so many great questions. We want to give every possible minute to speaking to the diversity, equity, and inclusion issues that matter to you most. So while we're going to be going through these questions that we've organized uh, as best we can, we really encourage you to continue to add more questions in the question and answer feature that is connected with this Zoom call. So there should be a chat feature, but there's also a Q&A. That way, if you, if you want to chat and make comments, you certainly can. But if you have specific questions, add them to the Q&A so we make sure that we get to as many of those as possible toward the end of the conversation. Uh, I am joined today, first of all, by my co-host, my very good friend and beloved colleague, Mr. Scott Zimmer. Hello. Hello and uh, together <laughs> at BridgeWorks, we have been sharing our generational insights with organizations who are looking for ways to improve the communication, the collaboration that exists between people of different ages. One of the companies that Scott and I have had the extreme privilege of working with over the last few years is an organization by the name of Medtronic. Now, they are probably best known around the world for their incredible advances in uh, medical device technology. They also happen to be headquartered in our home community right here in Minnesota. But in addition to that, they are also one of three recipients of the prestigious 2020 Catalyst Award, which recognizes groundbreaking initiatives uh, to foster an inclusive work workplace for women that truly uh, gives them opportunity for advancement. And one of the things that Scott and I have both really appreciated about our time with Medtronic is this is an organization that is passionate about creating a community where everyone of different uh, backgrounds, different uh, lenses can feel welcome and have a sense of belonging. And we are that that initiative that Medtronic is so involved in is supported by two amongst many other uh, people, but two outstanding guests that we have with us today. And so I am excited to introduce all of you if you haven't met them before to first of all, Mr. Matthew Shannon who is the Senior Diversity Programs Manager with Medtronic, and his colleague, Ms. Robin Hoy, who is the Senior Manager of Global Learning and Leadership Development. So we've organized the questions that you've already submitted uh, in a manner that we think and we're really confident is gonna tap into the different levels and areas of expertise that each of your panelists bring to this session. So we're excited to get to that. But before we get there, Scott, Tell them a little bit about how we got here. You got it. Thank you, Phil. Thank you, Robin. And thank you, Matthew, for being here as well. We're really excited for this. Uh, Phil and I have been working with BridgeWorks for many, many years now as keynote speakers and generational consultants. And that's really what BridgeWorks is all about. I know a lot of you right now have probably seen Phil or myself give a workshop or a keynote presentation at your company, but some of you might be new to who BridgeWorks is. We're a generational consulting firm. We have been around for over 20 years, um, really helping companies bridge gaps that can exist between generations in the workplace and in the marketplace. So whether it's baby boomers, generation Xers, millennials, or Gen Z, we go into organizations and we work with them on some of the clashes and struggles that can exist. And what I love about this job and what Phil and I do is that one, it's something everyone can relate to because we've all experienced those struggles before in the workplace. What works for communicating, engaging, motivating one person doesn't always work with another. But beyond that, for us, um, we love to get to the heart of what generational theory is all about, which is really looking at our own unique set of experiences growing up. And I know when it comes to diversity, equity, and inclusion, that in and of itself can be kind of a it's a tricky subject for some people to navigate. Uh, recently, I've been doing interviews for an upcoming speech that I have. And one of the people I was talking to, I like to talk to people within the organization a bit and get a sense of what's on their mind, what they'd like to hear. And somebody had told me that 
they felt the language of inclusivity can feel exclusive, which I thought was a brilliant turn of phrase. And that's, I think, a problem many organizations are facing, which is sometimes when we're having these really important, courageous conversations around diversity, equity, and inclusion, some people don't necessarily feel as involved or invested because they don't know if it necessarily applies to them. We, we love the idea of the generation's topic, topic being a great catalyst for those courageous conversations, because at the end of the day, we all belong to a different generation. We all come from these different backgrounds and we're all on these different journeys when it comes to how we view and what we've experienced when it comes to diversity, equity, and inclusion. Uh, another question I had asked this company when I was doing interviews is, when's the first time you remember hearing about diversity or inclusion or equity at your company? And depending on the generation, the answers varied. It's some people, oh, I remember 15 years ago, eight years ago, five years ago. But with every person I talked to, for them, the first time they really remember hearing about D, E, and I would be when they first were introduced to the concept of ERGs, employee resource groups. And that was really their first introduction to that. And they have become more widely known and more popular amongst organizations, in particular at Medtronic. So my first question is to you, Robin. Uh, if you don't mind, talk to us a little bit about ERGs. Talk to everybody about what they are and really what goes into implementing and executing a successful ERG program at a company. Mm -hmm. Well, thanks, Scott. Hi, everybody. Uh, welcome. And first of all, I have to say thank you, Scott and Phil and our friends at Bridgeworks for hosting Matthew and I and welcoming Medtronic into today's conversation. I couldn't just jump into the answer. I just say thank you. So let's get to your question. Um, there, there are different approaches, I would say, in starting ERGs. And I'll share kind of what we've done here at Medtronic in a couple of approaches that have worked for us. So I think it's two different approaches, um, common ones would be grassroots or corporate driven. So at Medtronic, we've done both. And today, I think it makes sense. I'll focus on the grassroots formula, but I wanna briefly mention our corporate driven approach. So several years ago, we established formal networks for our women, African descent, Asian descent, Hispanic, Latino, and LGBTQ+. Actually, that one was mo most recently within the last year. And um, for that, those employee groups, and each network is sponsored and funded by a team of executives who define the strategy for the network while committees of volunteer employees execute on that strategy. So this approach I wanted to share because it's a really strong testament to the, that our, our, our organization really is invested in DE&I and it sends that message out to our employees and it aligns with our mission and strategy. So just going back to this grassroots approach, which I'll kind of walk through how we have set it up. So we figured it out. I would say we've got a good formula and I can say that our guide team owns this this process and the formula. So I give all the credit to them and I get to, get to talk about it. So grassroots really is that feed on the ground approach designed and run by volunteer employees. So it's not corporate driven, it's designed and run by volunteers. And so we differentiate the corporate driven approach by terming those groups networks and then the grassroots as employee resource groups. So for example, we've got employee resource groups for veterans, um, one for employees with disabilities, which we call ABLED, one for Jewish employees, and several other ones similar to that. So grassroots really means that an employee or a group of employees have identified a need for this employee resource group. And we've made it easy, our guide team has made it easy to join an ERG at Medtronic, but there's always this chance that there are needs um, interests that we're not fulfilling through our current ERGs or networks. And so even though this, I, this need might be identified, we ask people once they have this con concept of an ERG, it's a pressure test. Um, and pressure testing will do things like, first of all, making sure that this concept, this ERG doesn't exist elsewhere in the organization. And if that's the case, then start building the business case for the ERG, start um, finding a sponsor, finding some leaders that you can 
um, have advocate for this. And then the business case would include things like, um, what are you trying to solve for by setting up the CRG? So sometimes we've found that an ERG is proposed, but there's no problem they're trying to solve. And in those cases, it's more kind of about the connections and enjoying pulling a similar group of people together. And while that's definitely one of the beautiful benefits of ERGs, if there isn't a problem to solve, the ERG might fall flat and people really need that purpose to drive forward. Um, so once you've kind of built a business case and some pressure testing within the, the group and the organization on some leaders to back them up, um, instead of reinventing the wheel, they'll, they can reach out to existing ERGs and say, hey, what are some best practices for setting up an ERG and collect those from them? Once they have everything put together, wrapped up in a beautiful bowl, we have them go through an application process that goes to our guide team, which our global inclusion, diversity, and equity team, which my friend Matthew is on. And they push a button, send the application, and that team receives the application. So, um, and then they'll, they'll look at the application and say, okay, is this have a vision? What are they looking to do? Is there a budget? Do they have sponsors? Have they validated that this is a need within the organization? And then the guide team says, okay, yep, that looks great. They meet with them, discuss it, um, set them up on the website and give them a shiny little button that can be pushed to join their ERG. And then once that ERG is established, so it's online, the, the people who have established it, the leaders, the committee members should um, plan a, a, an event. They need committee members, right? They need members to join now that they've got, the, got the, it set up. So um, a great way to do that is to plan and promote an engaging kickoff event, have a leader come and speak, do something fun where they can share what that vision of that ERG is. Here are some of the activities we're thinking about doing. And wouldn't you want to volunteer to join us? Always look for volunteers, right? Um, and then also just the general membership at large. So ask people at the time, hey, go on to our guide page and pu push the button to join this ERG. Uh, so let's see here, what else? Um, and then we recommend, so you've got the ERG set up, you're getting started, get some members and sponsors and you get your steering committee and you're running. Um, so you've got a sponsor, you wanna make sure you're engaging your sponsor properly. So we recommend you, you have quarterly connections with them. And that's where you're gonna give them updates on, hey, here's what we've done, here are some metrics, um, and here's maybe where we need some help, um, your help, or what else are you expecting from us? So those are really great ways to continue to engage your sponsor. It's important that they're not only there for you, but you're there for them. Um, so, and then the last piece I would say, <laughs> I'm talking a lot. So the last piece I'd say about this is really that measurement. So you've done the due diligence, you've figured out what you wanna do, you've been going say throughout your first year, you've had your sponsorship meetings, but how do you know if you're successful, what are some metrics that you can use? So there's metrics can be anything from kind of your level one smile sheet, so satisfaction. So are your members and participants happy with what you're offering and enjoying their experience? And everything to, you know, tracking things like promotions or career movements for that audience. Um, but whatever the metrics are, they should also be or really focus on what were the objectives that you set out to achieve in the first place? Are you solving the problem through the programming and efforts that you have set up through the CRG? I'll pause, that's my, that's my long answer. That is a fantastic answer. Thank you so much, Robin. Yeah, chock full of great advice okay. in there. And we wanted to start with the idea of building the strong system. Uh, we had a lot of great questions like, do you just do it? Or do you go with a plan? Do you not go with a plan? I love the fact that mm -hmm. uh, you talked about don't reinvent the wheel. When I, I had the chance to privilege speak at the um, Global Women's Network, as well as the African Descent Network, and I heard stories of how they learn, you learn from each other to build really uh, successful uh, groups, ERGs, so that it promotes 
people wanting to be a part of it. You just don't go into this willy nilly. You want them to be successful. And, and you've done that so really well. And I also like that pressure test start. You have to start with a purpose. And that speaks to now you know what your outcomes are. You can measure if it's successful, if you're meeting the purpose on the front end. So really great advice. I want to throw a question to our generational expert. I'm going to come back to Scott here for a second, because one of the things as organizations want to put these systems in place, they they might run into this question of how do different generations receive them? And we got a lot of questions about that, Scott. And speak to that. Uh, how do people of different ages view these DEI efforts? That's a great question. And I know sometimes people will say it. We make assumptions sometimes based on somebody's generation. And maybe a boomer gets labeled as, you know, uh, pretty rigid or set in their ways. And I'll talk to boomers who say, I don't feel that describes me or who I am or my mindset at all. So you got to put those misconceptions aside because we're all just people. That is true. But when you look at how these different generations came of age, um, if you look at Gen Z, your new talent that you're hiring right now, how they view diversity, equity, inclusion is immensely different than how a boomer did or an Xer did, or even a millennial did when they were starting their career. I can think of one example that I just came across last week. I was doing another interview uh, with somebody at an organization and he had said to me, when he started at his company or when he first applied at the company, he saw in the paperwork that they had uh, benefits for same sex domestic partnerships. And he, he goes, I remember thinking, wow, that's really cool. And I know for a lot of millennials, that was sort of a bragging right for a lot of them to be like, my company does this and my company supports that. What we find today with Gen Z, you're not gonna get that same reaction. It's now become this baseline expectation for companies when it comes to diversity, inclusion, equity, what have you. It's not a perk anymore. It is, this is what we're expecting from our companies. And that's a completely different mindset. I think um, a lot of people at the end of the day probably get the diversity part. I think it's the inclusion part that sometimes is where different generations see things differently. Um, I know a lot of younger talent have told me that they worry that the inclusion piece that's so important to them might be viewed as entitlement by older generations. When in fact, for them, they say that's really not the case at all. It's not about entitlement. It's about everyone at the company, not just them having that voice and feeling heard and valued and respected and understood. So that's become a baseline priority. And something I tell leaders uh, in regards to this, because there are those I think who might view even maybe the generations topic, Phil, when you and I come in to talk about it or diversity, equity, and inclusion is now these are kind of fluffy topics and they're not bottom line issues. So if money has to get allocated somewhere, maybe that's something that could get affected by that or something could get cut. I'm telling organizations and managers and people in these positions now, um, this is a bottom line issue. This is important, this is dollars, this is cents, this is recruitment and this is retention for your young talent because these efforts around inclusion and equity and diversity are so important and they're non-negotiables for young talent today. So that does that does that kind of answer your question? Absolutely. Okay, but good. Now, let's I'm get Matthew put, involved. Yeah, I want to get Matthew involved. I was just gonna say I want to get Matthew involved because Matthew, I want you to speak to this a little bit more on uh, how you see things on your end over at Medtronic. How do you create an environment where you can really encourage people, all people, all generations to participate in meaningful conversations around diversity, equity, and inclusion. What's, what have you found to be successful? Hey, thank you. And thanks for having me. I appreciate the time and the opportunity to join you all today for the discussion. So um, I'll, I'll, I'll say that uh, a lot of, you know, the perspective that I'll share just comes from a place of assuming that um, people have positive intentions. So most people, if you ask them if they were interested in helping to solve problems at the company, they would all agree, yeah, we're interested in doing that. We want to have a great cohesive work environment where all of our colleagues feel like they can be successful and that that actually uh, is true. 
by the data when you look at, you know, how our employees progress through um, the organization. So knowing that that um, is the case or with that assumption in place, um, really having behaviors that are being modeled that uh, allow people to um, really challenge uh, status quo. And it's basically creating a culture where people are allowed to um, speak their mind without fear of some sort of retribution or retaliation or challenging uh, what may be perceived as cultural norms in that workplace. And so, you know, Scott, you were just talking about the perception of inclusion. Inclusion could be perceived as entitlement by some. And, you know, I, I can understand how that uh, perception um, could be noted. And I will say that if we broaden our lens and think about the experiences um, of all of our employees and really just ask the question um, without having any sort of biased opinion about it, are all of our employees having the same experience? Because if each one of us is, is um, not feeling like we can speak up in a meeting or if we do challenge uh, kind of the status quo, then we're gonna be moved into the out group or lose favor with leadership or not have the same opportunities to grow in our career, then it's gonna suffocate the organization's ability to get the perspectives from all of its employees uh, in order to really have an accurate understanding on where they're at in their journey on inclusion, diversity, equity, and just as a successful company in their industry as a whole. And so what we've done at Medtronic, um, you know, was, was really uh, put some things in place where we have opportunities for community conversations similar to the discussion that we're having. So it, it's really important to create spaces for employees to um, share their perspectives. So, you know, in more of a formal or corporate speak, people would say capture the voice of customer, um, you know, thinking more about your internal customer. Your external customers are very important, but of course, if you don't have a, a, a strong workforce um, to be able to produce the results your company is responsible for, then you, you're not gonna be able to serve your customers and you're not gonna be a leader in the industry that you're, you're out there to serve. Well said. Can I jump in uh, with another question, um, Matthew? Yep. For a baby boomer, let's say, who when they started in the workplace, it was very, you know, and their bosses were traditionalists. So you didn't talk about personal mm -hmm. things at work and that's not appropriate. And now today we see that shift a bit. Do you find there are those people when we're trying to create a culture of having these conversations where there are those people and not necessarily boomers or even Xers like myself who can sometimes be a bit more nose to the grindstone with get our work done. Do you find there are people who sometimes have the attitude of why are we doing this? Why is this important? Uh, and if you do, how do you, how do you circumvent that? How do you work your way through it even? I'll say, um, you know, it goes back to um, the fact of, are we driving our organization forward or are we going to fall behind because we refuse to acknowledge the realities of the society we live in today and the business needs that we have today and the expectations from top talent, the expectations from our clients, the social responsibility that's on the table. If we refuse to acknowledge those things and create programs, processes, and mechanisms internally as well as externally to move things forward, then we're going to fall behind. So when you see um, or hear those kinds of uh, vibes boiling up in the meeting or in the conversation, um, you remind the, remind the team that we're all on the same trajectory. We're all here to move things forward. Each one of us has a different role on the team. So you use a sports analogy and you say, you've got a quarterback, you've got a running back, a receiver, and you've got people who play defense. You've got all these different role players. We come together for the same goal of the team. And that's the kind of culture that's needed in, able to, in order to be able to drive things forward. So really um, some of that coaching comes into play and enabling uh, leaders. And when I say leaders, I don't mean people who have a senior leadership title. I mean, 
identify who your leaders are, the people who have that perspective, people who will speak up and share their ideas and be innovative and be creative. And again, going back to that uh, mindset of being solution oriented, those are the kinds of conversations that you want to keep the meeting centered around, and then you can, you can build forward. I always enjoy your insights, Matthew. You can tell you have a sports background, uh, given the analogy that you shared, <laughs> but it makes so much yeah. sense. And it ties nicely to what Scott was just talking about in terms of this, this is a bottom line issue. And so you said, you know, to, to engage in this means to drive, are we driving forward or are we falling behind? And that's mm -hmm. often the language of those, um, you know, what, traditionally baby boomers or Gen Xers when we started our careers, that's what mattered most in the workplace. And now this is an important conversation that needs to happen to be successful. I want to, um, I want to raise a question and kind of speak to it because it's really, really fascinating, uh, a new fusion of diversity, equity, and inclusion and 2020. And so here was a question that came in that I want to speak to. And the question was, how do you help foster workforce, excuse me, workplace focus on, excuse me, how do you help foster a workplace focused on empathy and emotional intelligence during a time when people are stressed and pushed to their limits? And um, when we were having some conversation in preparation for today, you know, uh, Matthew and, and Medtronic have done a great job of hosting these community uh, conversations where people can, can discuss things. But let's face it, everyone's under pressure. And so I've been researching recently just what stress is and how do we continue to move forward with these conversations in the midst of a year like 2020. And first of all, let me just uh, speak to stress. What, what is stress? Stress essentially is the body's response to the mind perceiving a threat, right? It, all of nature does this. When we're under threat, there's a lion or there's something that might uh, pose danger to me. Uh, the brain sends this chemical cocktail of hormones into the body to and it creates some action, right? So adrenaline and cortisol starts flowing through the body so we move, so we can stay safe. Now, that's a very healthy thing for a brief moment in time that will keep us safe. But when we're stressed for endured uh, for long periods of time, that literally becomes unhealthy to our bodies. Uh, it down regulates our genes and can bring sickness uh, into your being. Now think about this. Uh, recent studies show that the majority of our society right now is feeling stressed 70% of the time, stressed about jobs, stressed about uh, family, stressed about health. When this goes on for a long period of time, that stress, which is that fight or fight or uh, freeze reaction, uh, has us focused on ourselves. We're worried about how we're going to do. Well, it's impossible to be uh, giving. It's impossible to be empathetic when you're focused on yourself. And uh, Scott's mentioned a lot about uh, Gen Z. Here's a study from the American Psychological Association. It says that 91% of Gen Z people between the ages of 18 and 21 say they've experienced at least one physical or emotional symptom due to stress in the past month versus 74% of adults overall. So our 91% of our Gen Z folks are feeling stress. And here's what stood out to me with this study. This was done in 2018, right? Life was easy in 2018 by comparison to today. And they're, you know, so they were saying they were stressed then. I can't imagine how they're feeling now. So how do, you, how do we move forward and create these conversations uh, when people are already feeling stressed? And Matthew, you've hit on some of the important keys when you said you have to assume people have positive intention. In other words, you gotta go in and change our thinking about what this is. We're not addressing problems. You throw another problem at somebody and we're already too stressed to deal with problems. Really what this is, is an opportunity. And like Scott pointed out, you gotta speak the language of each person that you're working with. So for baby boomers, it is an opportunity to stay competitive. For Gen Xers, it's an opportunity to be more in efficient when we're inclusive. For millennials, it's an opportunity to be innovative in a world that's constantly changing. And for Gen Z, it's an opportunity to find true equity and equality around people. So when you begin to change the way people think about it, it's no longer doesn't have to be a 
courageous necessarily conversation because to take courage means there's a threat involved. It's a community conversation. Our last uh, one of these, we had Rich Catarano come in and talk to us and he shared something that's always stuck out with me. It will stay with me the rest of my life. So often society right now goes into these thinking it's a debate. I've got to convince you I'm right and you're going to try to convince me you're right. No, he says it's a discussion. All we are is learning about one another. And Medtronic, again, has done such a nice job with this because it's a part of your culture at Medtronic that if you're going to advance in your careers and, and become a leader, they encourage people to be a part of these ERGs because if you're going to lead uh, at all, you have to be able to lead all. You have to understand the different lenses of diversity that exists out there. So it's no longer you know, a bad thing to participate. It's really an important part of your advancement, your growth as a career. So I think, yes, if you're, we got to recognize that people are stressed, but if you change the conversation, change the way they think about it, they're far more likely to engage in what needs to be done. Which now brings me to another question I want to pose back to Robin. Uh, one of the things that has been so successful at Medtronic is your leadership has embraced this. Uh, but there are people on this call, and here's a specific question that came in. How do you engage leaders within a large company? We find that our employees want to see our leadership participating in our DEI, DEI activities. And sadly, that's not often the case. What would you advise people on this question? Mm. That is sad, and, and all, I, I will show my hand, my transparency and say, and it's disappointing, right? I mean, we should be further along. And I'll kind of share from this Medtronic lens and you know, what makes it so sex, successful here. And we're really fortunate, we have this mission that really is, is embedded in our culture. And we have leaders starting at our top, our CEO, that are invested in DEI and they let us know, they talk about it both internally and externally. We know where our leaders stand and, and they need to be, leaders need to be held accountable too. So we've established IND goals really for all employees, but in addition to those goals, our top leaders have compensation now tied to their IND goals here at Medtronic. And so it, it's, I can't envision a scenario without your top leadership in an organization committed to DEI, where you can successfully see the change and embed engagement at all levels. I mean, I'd be really curious to understand, you know, why they're not engaged at, at these organizations, whoever posts this question, you know, is it all leaders? Is it some leaders? Is it pockets? Is it a certain level? Is it your mid-level managers or is it your top leaders? I mean, they could be seeing that the top leadership is not making it a priority. Maybe they don't understand the value. We were talking about value. Um, and maybe they don't know what it means to be an inclusive leader. But again, if you don't have your top leaders engaged in advocating for DE&I, it's really fighting an uphill battle. So that's, that's my perspective. Um, others might see it differently, but I'll, I'll share. And, and before we got on a call, I was sharing with uh, with, with Bridgericks about what we did here at Medtronic yesterday. It was really, really an amazing celebration of excellence. So we've been hosting these global celebrations um, annually for many years now. And this was the first year, of course, that it is all virtual. So that was that was different because in the past, of course, some people were able to come together to be part of that, that celebration. And the, the winners that won different awards were able to be congratulated and get their awards in person. Uh, but during this time, there was some of the awards were for people that demonstrated that they were leaders in the DEI space. And it was really cool to see the global representation um, and the, the meaningful change they were making. And some of them were within the organization, but also within their communities, which is really important is, is that we, that's part of our mission here at Medtronic is what are we doing within our own communities to make change? So it was really a powerful investment yesterday just to watch that, watch our CEO moderating this celebration and see what our leaders are doing for the organization, for our employees and really for our reputation. So I don't know if that helps, but that's really comes from the Medtronic perspective and what's really worked here. That's awesome. Thank you, Robin. Uh, Phil, I had another question come in. I wanted to uh, share with everybody and see if I could take a stab at this. Um, how should a black female Gen Xer effectively influence her millennial manager to one, 
fully engage in the firm's efforts to promote racial understanding and equity at a team level, and two, not view Gen Xers as competition, but as knowledgeable and capable assets to the team. Well, I can speak to the Xer part. And uh, I will say this, managing up the idea that um, younger managers are managing people who are older than them is becoming more and more common because I think oftentimes we think of millennials as fresh out of college and 25 years old. The oldest millennials in 2020 are turning 40 years old. So many millennials have been working for a decade plus and have grown in their career and many are in positions of management, uh, which means they are now managing people who are I mean, sometimes old enough to be their parents uh, or managing people who've been with the company longer than they have. And it can create strange dynamics from time to time. Um, so here's what I will say. If you're an Xer or a boomer and you maybe feel a little weird in that scenario, know that millennial managers feel that awkwardness the same as you because I talk to them all the time. Phil and I actually do a session for many millennial managers specifically because they are striving to understand the best way they can manage not just people younger than them but people older than them in a way that everybody feels respected and um really create a team that has synergy even though you yourself maybe haven't been there as long as they have so what i tell people all the time is be aware of who your audience is uh phil and i we both uh when we started at bridgeworks our manager was a millennial and Phil and I are both proud Xers. And uh, we realized her approach to work was maybe a little different than how we would approach it and how we communicate and what have you. Uh, some of the top traits of millennials that we talk about at companies, they're collaborative. You got to keep in mind, this is a generation that grew up during a time when collaboration was king. For any millennial on the session right now, think back to elementary school, junior high, high school, Think about all the group projects and the group work that you guys did and you're giving everyone in the team a grade on the work that they did. Uh, you had those successory posters in your classroom that were about teamwork and it was, you know, a dozen people rowing a boat. It was all about teamwork. Whereas extras like Phil and I, we were the latchkey kids. We were kind of left to our own devices. We were told if you want something done right, you got to do it yourself. We had a more independent, uh, efficient, approach to things. Just, I, I know how to do it. I'll do it. We don't need to get together as a team. Uh, beyond collaborative, they're innovative. They're experience-driven. You got to look at what, what approaches your manager takes, what gets them excited. And so when you propose ideas, be it around equity and diversity or whatever it might be, maybe it's something completely outside of the realm of DE&I, um, present it in a way that speaks to their language. Make it inclusive. Uh, get them involved, um, make it more of a, let's bounce ideas off of one another. Um, that way you're hearing everybody's ideas. I think managers like that, millennial managers, managers especially enjoy being a part of the conversation and not left out of it. And I think a lot of times Xers aren't realizing when we kind of like just close the door and do things ourselves because we're efficient and we can get it done. And heck, we're at a life stage now where We've got kids at home. We've got aging parents we look after. We're sandwiched. You know, Phil, you talked about stress earlier and how different generations are feeling it. Xers are feeling it as well. And there are Xers now who are in their mid 50s who are becoming grandparents. So now you're talking about a club sandwich generation at that point. There's a lot of demands of Xers. So sometimes we don't think to take a breath and get other people involved and hear different ideas. We just think what's the quickest and fastest way to do this. So if you are an Xer and with a millennial manager and you wanna get ideas heard and you wanna get on their page, be innovative, be collaborative, um, create an experience. That's something that really speaks to millennials and has ever since they were young. Thank you, Scott. My mute was on, so I started speaking. Um, I've noticed there's a couple questions have come into the chat, which is awesome. And I, I saw one that's kind of responsive to what uh, Robin was speaking to. 
We will try to get to that. Do me a favor though, if you weren't on when I mentioned this earlier, try to ask your questions in the Q&A because I don't want to lose them in the chat. I'm loving some of the conversation, uh, some of the, you've commented on what you've appreciated, but I, I want to make sure we get to your questions. So thank you. And Robin, love that uh, thought about the Medtronic is celebrating every person at a high level that, you know, and so to the one question I'm reading here, some executives compensation isn't enough to engage them. Another person pointed out that middle, you know, mid-level managers uh, often don't want to engage in this. But I think when an organization decides they're going to celebrate this and they see people around going, this is awesome. It all of a sudden creates a new incentive because as you said, it's a part of the culture, not just uh, a program per se. This is who we are. And people will find that either they want to stay or they want to go. Um, but if they stay, that's, that's how you get celebrated. Matthew, a question came in that is tailor-made for you based on what you've shared with me about your background and some of your uh, early career and profession. And I I'm looking forward to hearing your answer to this one. This is about addressing barriers to entry, specifically for underrepresented uh, members of community. So here's the question. How do you ensure participation from underrepresented communities during a pandemic when all public outreach is digital? There are these barriers to entry in many disadvantaged, community, disadvantaged communities and we are looking for innovative ways to increase public participation. So uh, share a little bit about your background and what could you, what advice can you give? Hey, so I'll, um, thank you. I'll, I'll share that, you know, I grew up, um, I grew up in the, in the city. I grew up in South Minneapolis here. Um, I was raised by my mom, have one younger brother. And, um, you know, uh, with that, uh, it brings its own set of, of different circumstances where you are, doing the best you can with what you know. So exposure uh, is everything as we know. And, you know, to the question about how do we get exposure when we have limited access? Um, I would say that there are a lot of new um, grants that have been given to different community groups that have spawned up um, in different communities. So um, I would say, depending upon where you're located, um, utilize uh, those, those local resources that are tailored to connect um, folks from underrepresented groups or underserved groups or communities that don't typically have the same level of access to resources, um, start there. And then I always say, um, if something's missing from your community and you have the ability to bring that to your community and you can partner with other people who have gifts resources and abilities to help you deliver that to the community, I would uh, definitely connect with those folks uh, because there's a lot of people who are looking for ways to help and you have to put yourself out there to be someone uh, to say, hey, we, we're looking for a partner with this. Here's where we have gifts. Here's where we have skills. Here's where we have resources. But here's where we need some additional help, knowledge, resources, access, exposure, so on and so forth. So really com creating those partnerships, uh, community partnerships. Um, I know that sometimes um, trust is also an issue uh, as to where that help comes from. So I would say we all have to um, just realize that we're gonna have to trust someone and um, why not trust uh, the people who are putting themselves out there to say, hey, I want to help, um, and here's, here's how I can help. And so really, uh, for those on the call who may have resources or access to resources, um, our communities, a lot of the time, miss the opportunity to collaborate with one another. And I see this all the time in different companies and organizations. We um, you know, solicit or hire external consultants to tell us about what's going on in our own company instead of listening and asking the people in our communities, what, what do you see is happening? And when you get those different perspectives from those different levels of the organization, all the way through associate level, you know, all the way up through your C-suite level, um, you can get a better picture of what's going on. And then in your communities, you, you can do the same thing. But if you discount your own community and don't really take in the ideas or you don't take in the perspectives that don't align with the majority view, 
Um, I think that's what happens a lot in DEI work is that sometimes people have a difficult time listening to a perspective that doesn't align with their own. And when we do that, um, we miss a lot of information because there's not the, the room for everybody to be heard and to share. So I'll just say really um, taking a look at whose voice are you getting involved in the conversation? Um, what are the existing resources that are there to help different communities uh, with the resources or knowledge or skills or exposure uh, that's needed in that community? And really tap into that. I know that when I was growing up, there was a lot of different community organizations that we were able to partner with. And, you know, they didn't have state of the art sports facilities or state of the art dance or art or, you know, any sort of like facility that would just blow your mind. But they had people there who had the knowledge and who had the desire to help. And when you have that, then you can build something bigger. Because Starting something um, is, is the key. You don't want to say, well, since we don't have this yet, we're not going to do anything. So start from where you're at and, and build from there. That's great. Thank you, Matthew. Phil, anything you would add to that? Something that popped into mind because I've been talking to so many people lately prepping for speeches. Um, I've heard from people who have said things like, I remember when I was the only black person at my company or the only gay person at my company or the only Indian person at my company. And it can be an awkward feeling like you're the big bird sitting at the conference table amongst everybody else. Um, what would you say to people who, <laughs> are you picturing that? That is, a, that is a word picture, my friend. <laughs> yeah, but what do you say to people who maybe aren't working in big companies like a Medtronic or uh, maybe aren't working at as diverse of companies um, where they still feel like they're a bit more of the outsider and don't have necessarily these ERGs to uh, really connect with other people who they feel that, you know, you know, similar bond with. What would you say to that? Yeah, it, it's definitely an important question. And I'm, I'm just keeping an eye on the chat here. Someone just said they could listen to Matthew all day long. And I absolutely agree with you. <laughs> we, we've had a good, good conversation. Um, but let me speak to this question that Scott just raised, because it is important. And, I, and I, there's a couple of things just to think about briefly. First of all, um, you know, I think you're probably on this call because you're interested in, in learning more about how do you create this inclusive environment. And, may, and there are a lot of communities that they look around, they go, yeah, but we're not, you know, Medtronic is what, 140,000 people worldwide. I mean, we have so much culture. We're just a small group located in, you know, fill in the blank community. And it doesn't look like we have much diversity. And I'm going to go back to something Scott said in the very beginning. The reason we use generations as kind of a launch point is, in, in and of itself, there's always generational diversity. Every community at every point in history, even though they might come from the same culture, speak the same language, dance to the same music, there's still within that different generational perspectives. There's gender diversity. And the truth of the matter is Gen Z in America is the last generation that will be primarily uh, of a Caucasian descent. Generations following Gen Z, we're going to see more and more different what we might traditionally classify as diversity coming in. Every community is changing. So our advice would be start with what you have. Uh, look around and celebrate, much like Robin mentioned. There's diversity everywhere. It, comes, it shows up in so many different forms, faith diversity, um, you name it. And so to begin to have people, invite people to share their story, like Scott said, it's really about the unique experience that a person has had that represents, that's what diversity is made up of. And we've all had unique experiences. And when we begin to view diversity as a different set of experiences, that in and of itself, it goes back to what I was saying earlier, it changes the conversation. Because every one of us at some point has filled out a resume, uh, an application, and we put on there our experiences because we believe experience, more experience, better. Well, more generational experience, more diversity experience, that's better. It changes our perspective and our viewpoint about what it really boils down to. We talk a lot about systemic racism. It's a real thing that we're battling, we're fighting in our country. 
And I'm quoting this phrase today. I'm going to call it systemic inclusivity. I have a friend out in um, California by the name of Marsha Bonner. And we had a conversation a couple years ago. And she saw, we were, you know, she's an African-American woman, powerful executive. And she said, you know, I don't like inclusivity because I don't want to feel included. Uh, she prefers equity because that's a true opportunity. And I agree with uh, Marsha completely. But what I want us to realize, inclusivity is something you give to someone else. It's something that happens within you. It's a belief internally that you realize, wow, I am better off when I include someone who's different. And there's lots of differences out there, like I mentioned earlier. We offer equity. We offer a, uh, uh, an environment where there's belonging. But when you truly begin to stop and think about what's the value of these different experiences and, and appreciate it inside, that's when you begin to rise to levels of, I want in, I want to be inclusive. I want to invite other perspectives in there. And one of the questions that came in just a little bit earlier, I think it was in the Q&A. Uh, thank you for putting it in the Q&A. Um, the question was, how do you balance between an inclusive workplace and having way too many people included to the point that you're no longer effective or timely in making decisions? It's a great question. And mm -hmm. so while we're promoting inclusivity, we don't want to prevent efficiency. Uh, but there are tools and tactics out there that can, uh, once you celebrate it and get, embrace it, it can be really good. Uh, so I want to throw that question out to the panel, and I'm going to add one more. And please, if there are other questions that you have, add them as we go here, because we've got about eight minutes, maybe five minutes of open questions that we want to get to. Um, here was a question that came in, and anyone can speak to it, but here it is. What's the best way to determine if the words used in your industry are still okay or should be updated to be more inclusive? And this is one that uh, I personally run into because there's certain things I might say and not even realize it was fine when I was growing up, but it's no longer okay today. And there's a lot of industry words that show up that way as well. So uh, Robin, Matthew, Scott, any thoughts to that question? I'm actually curious to hear what Robin or Matthew have to say on that one. So Robin, do you have any thoughts on that? Yeah, you know, and we're going through that, and I'm mean, hearing that as I talk to different vendors that we're looking at in terms of bringing in inclusion training. But um, you know, the, the even the the idea of um, how uh, my pronouns, you know, my she, I'm she, her, hers, and some people, you know, how people are want to be represented. So I would say yes, it, it would be great to kind of think about what those inclusive words, even guys, hey guys that one can be offensive to people. And that's something that this Gen X, <laughs> that, that's something we've said for many years, but it could be, it could be, you know, offensive. So I think it will take time and people need to be patient because these are, they, they kind of go into this unconscious biases. We don't realize these are things that we're used to saying and doing over time. And it's going to take us time to unravel and change our behaviors and that language and to deprogram us to be more thoughtful and inclusive in our behaviors and languages. Yes, I am guilty yeah. of the hey guys thing from time to time. And it's something I have to remind myself of because again, yes, when mm -hmm. something's ingrained in you for 30 years, it doesn't always change overnight. But um, our last community conversation, um, a really interesting point was made where uh, he said, we sometimes have to suspend our right to be offended when we have these conversations. And I, I think that's important because in the cancel culture that we now sort of live in, we're all so scared of saying the wrong thing that sometimes we don't say anything. And that's not how we're going to learn. That's not how we're going to grow or get better. Um, Matthew, what do you say to that? I was going to say, yep, I agree with everything that was stated previously, and I would add a resource. Um, there's a website called voicesofequity.com. I had a chance to attend a webinar from them uh, yesterday, actually, uh, and they're doing some work around the language of inclusion and diversity, and I, I thought it was really interesting and, and would uh, recommend folks to just check it out um, regarding that specific question on um, is the language and terminology that we're using still relevant? Uh, I kind of want to circle back, Phil, to the question that uh, came in a little bit earlier that you had asked briefly. How do you balance an inclusive workplace and having too many people included to the point where you're not being effective uh, or timely in decision making? We've all been in that too many cooks in the kitchen uh, where 
collaboration, while often positive and considered a, a positive word, can sometimes hinder a process, but you don't want people to feel excluded. Because remember in the beginning, I said, you know, it's all about how do we make inclusivity not feel exclusive, but feel inclusive. Robin, do you have any thoughts on that? I, I'm, I'm nodding my head because that's me. I'm the, I'm the includer. I want to make sure everybody has a voice and everybody weighs in, but then I'm also that one person that slows everything down. So, um, you know, you just have to be smart in balancing who are the right people to include, who are the right people to just provide awareness to, who are the right people to, you know, to, to bring into the conversation so you don't slow things down. Um, that, and that's our culture here at Medtronic too, is we've got um, so many different people matrix across the organization that we've had to include. We're trying to change that to move faster. Um, so yeah, it's a balance, but you just, just be thoughtful and aware of what you're, um, what you're trying to solve and why you need to pull the people along that you're inviting. Great answer. We got another couple questions in here. We're just a few minutes left, but they're really good ones, really important ones. Um, and I'll I'll pose this to to Matthew specifically. How do you balance merit and inclusivity when you're recruiting? Should a person be hired just because they meet the equal uh, opportunity goals or equal employment opportunity goals, uh, even if they don't meet the requirements of the position? What do you think about that? Uh, makes me laugh. Um, so I'll say that there's, there's enough there's enough talent out here um, to fill more roles than than are available. Uh, so I would say uh, it's really important, really, just to to monitor and really manage your talent recruiting processes and ensure that they align with your hiring processes. The two are not the same. You have a talent recruiting process and you have a hiring process. And when you have the right alignment, um, you eliminate bias from those processes that allow you to really get the best talent, period, versus, um, you know, continuing to get this homogeneous list of final candidates. So some people will probably talk about diversifying your candidate slates and, and all of that. And I think that's really awesome. But I would say it's important uh, really to understand how are our processes that we're using to recruit talent aligning with our desired hiring outcomes um, to continue diversifying our workplace. So as it relates to hiring people, you know, just because of they have a specific dimension of diversity uh, that you're looking for in that specific role doesn't necessarily, um, you know, mean that you're gonna get the best candidate. However, if you have processes designed to get the best candidate, and also it recruits from a diverse talent pool, then your, your chances of hiring someone um, from a diverse um, you know, dimension is gonna be higher. So I would say it's important to really align those processes, um, take a look at um, just your historical data and really understand you know, what have we been doing uh, that's gotten us the results that we have now and where could we make changes um, that would actually help us get different results. So uh, of course, it, it's kind of a no brainer to say you don't hire people just because of, you know, one thing. And even if someone has one thing on their resume that really jumps out to you, regardless of their um, ethnicity or dimension of diversity, um, it doesn't mean you're going to hire them. So there's a ton of things that should be taken into consideration when hiring the best talent. And those things should, uh, should continue to be um, measured appropriately. Thank you so much, Matthew. Phil, we got one minute left. Do you think we need to wrap things Let's up? Let's wrap it up. Uh, now questions are coming in. Uh, one question was, what's someone you ask someone who doesn't see the value of uh, inclusion, diversity, and equity? And I would just ask that person, um, who's been the most influential person in your life? Who do you admire? Who do you respect the most? What did you learn from them? And in, invariably, it's going to be someone who had a different set of experiences, who had learned things in a way that they hadn't learned them. We've all been positively influenced by someone who has a different set of experiences. And when you frame it that way, it changes the conversation. For the sake of time, we have to wrap these up. I want to value our valuable guest time. Guest time. Thank you so much. Uh, I'm reading these chats, and both of you are getting great responses by the attendees. 
So we uh, greatly appreciate your time today and uh, wish that we had more time to share. I want to invite everyone. We've got another uh, community conversation coming up next month with Dr. Elwood uh, Robinson, who is the Chancellor of Winston-Salem State University, uh, a uh, prestigious HBCU. We're gonna be talking specifically, if you're an organization that is wanting to hire uh, people of diversity and you're just not sure how to go about it, how do you create a culture within your organization that's going to be ready to receive fresh perspectives, fresh minds, uh, young minds with a lot of talent uh, that you're not going to want to miss this conversation. Uh, Chancellor Robinson is is brilliant. He's engaging. He's fun, and we're going to love it. So thank you so much. Um, we'll do our best to stay in touch with you. But until our next engagement, have an amazing rest of your day.